so I'll get you that. What we're going to do is continue our dive into commissioner power. This will be a powerful class because what we want to get into after we start talking about some a current event is commissioner power in terms of uh, team control. And what we've seen a lot in sports the past five years, 10 years, uh, is commissioners getting into what teams can or can't do. We'll talk about the uh, Finley case. We'll talk about Chris Paul situation. And of course, what's on everyone's mind who follows sports is this idea of super teams, uh, especially in basketball. And what can be done from a commissioner point of view or what can't be done. It is a sports topic. It is a legal topic. It is a business topic. It is a policy topic. It is something that sports fans can sink their teeth into in a deeper way than just talking about you know, surface issues. So commissioner power is a lot of things. What we're going to start the class talking about is commissioner power over personal conduct, which we have a lot of cases on lately, as you, anyone who's followed the NFL. And then we'll delve into sort of commissioner power over team conduct, especially with this idea of getting bad, Sam Hinkey, <laughs> so you can get good, and whether that is something leagues can, in the form of the commissioner, can legislate. Uh, that is a huge topic in all of sports right now. What has happened not only with the super teams of the NBA, this has happened in baseball, continues to happen in baseball. It is happening, uh, some people would argue, in the NFL with the Browns or the Jets or teams like that. And I know there's some Jets fans in here and we can talk about that. But commissioner power over players is something we're talking about a lot. Today's class, we're going to talk a lot about commissioner power over team conduct, which is really an interesting dynamic because as we spent the first two classes talking about, it's the teams that control the commissioner in terms of hiring and firing and paying, yet the commissioner is disciplining his quote unquote bosses. Uh, and that's the essence of the Finley case. It's the essence of the Chris Paul case and all those kind of things. Okay, that's our roadmap for today. Should be a really interesting dynamic class. Want your input. Uh, this is kind of the fun area of the course where we get into topics that are directly engaged with what's going on in sports right now. Speaking of which, uh, what's dominating the news in sports law, in fact, you see every sports law expert like myself is out there in the news right now talking about Ezekiel Elliott because it is turned into a league issue, turned from a league and team issue into a legal issue. We're in the courts. Uh, which is very rare for a player discipline matter. It has been taken out of the system that the league's put in place into the courts, a la Tom Brady two years ago. So we are back in the Tom Brady status of two years ago. We're in the courts, and we'll talk about that. But to give sort of a background as we get into this whole really deep issue of domestic violence, attitudes towards women, how to treat that, how to deal with it. Uh, I have a special guest who's a good friend, Ashley Fox. Let's give her a warm welcome. <laughs> Ashley and I have worked together at different times at Sports Illustrated. She was there, I'm there now. We work together at ESPN. She's covered the Eagles and other teams for the Philadelphia Inquirer. Anyone who's a Philly fan knows her. And she and I are neighbors. She and I are parents of Shipley School kids. Uh, and. Uh, it's just a pleasure to have her. So I'm going to let her talk about her background briefly. I know she's on a time limit. And then we can sort of delve into this Elliot thing because she has some experience dealing with, again, male issues <laughs> in sports. <laughs> so welcome. I'll let you start. Thank you. I wish I could stay for the whole class. Yeah. It sounds like it's going to be really great. <laughs> uh, just a little bit of my personal background. I grew up in North Carolina. My father was a college basketball coach, so I grew up around uh, some of the really great co uh, college players that rolled through the ACC in the um, 70s, 80s, and early 90s. And uh, I ended up going to Indiana University for school. I wanted to be a sports writer, much to my father's chagrin. <laughs> he thought it was a horrible career decision and 
uh, he might have been right, but <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Uh, and then out of college, so when I was in college, I uh, worked at what was then the student newspaper. Uh, I had internships in, at various places, a TV station in D.C., the Baltimore Sun, and then finally at Sports Illustrated out of college that I turned into a full-time job. Worked there for four years, decided I wanted to, I was a reporter, which basically meant you were a glorified fact checker. Um, ended up getting to do some reporting assignments, did a little bit of writing, but really hadn't gotten, I wanted to be like a beat writer for a team. So I left, moved to Louisville, Kentucky, covered the University of Louisville men's football and basketball teams for three years. Um, in 2000, came here to work for the Philadelphia Inquirer, where uh, I had, I like to say, I had front row seats for some of the best press conferences <laughs> ever in sports. Uh, one was the Allen Iverson press conference. Um, I didn't ask the question that facilitated, we're talking about practice, but I asked the follow-up to that question, which was, if you think, you know, you might not need to practice, but don't you think if you practice, you'd make your teammates better, to which Iverson responded, how the hell do you think if, uh, I'm going to make my teammates better by practice? <laughs> and it was great because it's the anniversary of that press conference. Right. SI had put that on Twitter and it was did like a video of it. It was really cool. Uh, so I got Iverson. I had T.O. when he was here. So I was out on the, you know, I had the, the push-up uh, <laughs> driveway press conference followed by a couple months later by the Rosenhaus Next Question press conference. <laughs> uh, had a World Series championship parade I got to go to, which was really fun. I left in 2011 to go cover the National Football League for ESPN.com and ESPN, uh, where I worked until April 26th when I got laid off. So I am now um, still currently employed, but looking for other opportunities, either in media or teaching or something else. So that's a little of my background. And when you see, uh, I mean, there may be some people in here that want to get into media. Um, we've talked about some of the changes media is going through. What has changed in, from your experience? I mean, you've seen it all. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the thing that's, it's, it's hard to anticipate what's going to happen with the television end of the industry, but it does seem like, uh, given particularly people you guys' age and even younger, what's, you know, People are consuming television in, in a new way, in a different way, and it's on their on your phone, you know, on your iPad, whatever. I, I don't know anyone under the age, probably of 30, who actually has cable. Um, you know, everyone's watching Netflix or Hulu or whatever, and so I think, you know, for for someone like ESPN, they're trying to find out, you know, where what the distribution model is going to look like and how they're going to make money from that, because right. for years. For every cable subscriber, they get $7. And it's the highest by far fee for a cable outlet. And those, you know, the number of subscribers is just going precipitously down. Right. And it's the exact same thing that happened to the newspaper industry through the internet. You know, the newspaper industry could never figure out how to monetize the internet and slowly, you know, it eroded. And I think that's, you know, certainly from someone like ESPN, that's at least one of the explanations they're giving for having, you know, this is, right. they laid off 300 people last year, and then they laid off over 100 talent this past spring, um, and they're obviously trying to figure it out. How different is covering a local teams like you did here versus sort of a national coverage for ESPN with, with the NFL? Well, it's funny, when I start, I, like, I always wanted to work on a, the national level and was very happy to get to do so, but... In like my first six months of being there, I was like, wow, like I, I had this void that I couldn't quite fill because I knew everyone in Philadelphia. The yeah. owners, the players, the coaches, I have every phone number of anybody who rolled through here basically you know, in the 2000 to 2010. And so if I needed to talk to Andy Reid, I would text Andy Reid. Or if I needed to talk to you know, Billy King, who was the general manager of the Sixers for a long time, I would text him. It was never any, really any problem to get to talk to the people that you needed to talk to. And then you go on the national level and it's just a broader scope and yeah. it just takes time to develop that network. And uh, it's certainly, I was able to do it, but like I'd be lying if I said, okay, I have just as good of contacts at, you know, the now Los Angeles Chargers as I do at 
the Eagles or the Chiefs, where half the team you know was from here, <laughs> from a management coaching perspective, you know it's just you can't be totally dialed in with every single team to, at the same depth level. Right. So that was probably the biggest difference. And then transitioning to sort of what we're going to talk about with this Elliott case. You know, it was, an, it was a new new era after the Ray Rice video. You, you know, you're in it. You knew of things going on before Ray Rice, but of course there was the video. Um, I guess just talk about your experience. And again, being sort of a woman in a male-dominated world in sports media. Well, there's, you know, there's... There's a lot to it. One thing that was really interesting to me during that time was um, talk about you know having contacts and who you know and and uh, I was I had been for a very long time tight with John Harbaugh, the coach of the Baltimore Ravens, who was the special teams coordinator in Philly forever. And he likes to say that I was like I wrote the first you know newspaper story on him being a special teams coach and like gave him recognition. Mm -hmm. It's kind of he claims you know started his <laughs> path toward becoming. Uh, a head coach, and so I have his number. Well, at the, at the time of the Ray Rice thing, I was the only media person that had his number, because I remember sitting on set of a show I was doing with Schefter, Adam Schefter one day, and I was like, I did a note on the show about something Ravens related, and he's like, oh, I, can I use that you know, this weekend? I'm like, sure, just say that you know, John Harbaugh told me in a text, and he goes, you have Harbaugh's number? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, he goes, nobody's got Harbaugh's, Harbaugh's number. I'm like, <laughs> You don't have Harbaugh's number, like you have everybody's number. So uh, my, the point of that is, is that when the Ray Rice stuff was going on, I took a lot of heat from him because he was very frustrated, I think, with the media coverage of the Ray Rice thing. And he didn't have anybody to lash out at because he didn't have anybody's number except for mine. Yeah. So I, I heard from him a lot throughout that process. But uh, I afterward said to him, I'm like, you know, you guys are one of the most well-run, well-respected organizations, not only in the National Football League, but in sports, in my opinion. The owner's great, spends money, you know, got beautiful facilities. It looks like a big castle, their practice facility. They've got an indoor bubble, outside fields. Everything's pristine. He's great to work for. The general manager is awesome. He, he's you know, well-respected, always picks good players. Uh, Harbaugh is... A, Super Bowl winning head coach. Um, their uh, head of PR has been doing it forever and is well respected. And I was like, and you guys still so massively screwed this up <laughs> from the jump, right? Like, I mean, they, the PR director wrote like this opus to, um, on their website to Ray Rice after the allegations came out saying what a great guy he was. And then, you know, when the video, or I think it was, I can't remember the exact chron chronology of it. But you know, at one point, they had Ray Rice and Janae Rice at a press conference, but right. they didn't allow Janae to speak. And then they had her at the practice facility, but she was sitting up like on a deck. And it just the optics of it were bad. And then you know, when it came time for Janae to, to give her case or, or, or speak to Roger Goodell, they had her speak to Roger Goodell in front of Ray, in front of John Harbaugh, in front of Ozzie Newsom, the general manager. There wasn't a female in the room. And I made that point on TV. I was like, how can you not, this is a woman who has been um, abused, a victim of domestic violence that the whole world has seen on this video. And you guys are having her speak to the most powerful man in sports in front of the man who beat her, his boss, and another boss, and there's not a female in the room. Like that's 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 inexcusable that that would happen, and it never dawned on them, mm -hmm. any of them, that that wasn't okay. And my point to Harbaugh was like, you know, you guys so screwed this up because you didn't have, you know, the five decision makers with the Ravens at least, they're all men, and like, it, you know, you have to have diversity of thought and opinion, and someone else in the room. So these kind of mistakes don't happen. Because I said, if I'd been in that room, I would have been like, are you crazy? Like, you can't have her, you can't do all this. And, but they never had that opinion. And I thought, probably unrealistically, that that might have changed as a result from the Ray Rice thing. But I, you know, at least on the team level, the league level, it's changed a little bit. 
at least on the surface. Yeah. But still, the you know, the main people in those rooms, either at at the league office or with, I would say, 30, 30 out of the thirty-two teams, it's there's not a female in the room at that level of right. decision making, and that's a problem, in my opinion. Well, and after that, as we'll talk about here, I mean, the league hired all these domestic violence counselors. Uh, or people in that business, the woman who led the sex crimes prosecution in Manhattan, uh, the DA there, Lisa Friel, running that part of the NFL office now. But this Elliott case bringing us up to the present, uh, allegedly, we're told, uh, the woman who interviewed the complaining witness about Elliott, the woman he allegedly beat up, uh, was the investigator found her to not be credible. Uh, the NFL is supposedly ignoring that and saying, we're not getting into that. What I'm trying to get to is this is really delicate, right? Because if they believe the one investigator that says this woman's not credible, then they're sort of ignoring domestic violence. If they believe her, then it's the victim shaming. Um, how do you deal with this? I mean, from your viewpoint. Oh, I mean, it's super complicated. Yeah. Very layered. I mean, the fact that, you know, he wasn't legally charged with any wrongdoing right. in and of itself. Now the league is, is, you know, being judge and jury on something that there wasn't a judge and jury for because there wasn't enough evidence. I mean, it's, right. it's a slippery slope. And, you know, looking at it from, from where I sit, you know, had Ray Rice not happened, right. would we be sitting here looking at Zeke Elliott missing six games? I don't know that we would be. And that doesn't make what's happening to him right or wrong. But the fact that Ray Rice did happen and then there's this other story, like there was no way they were going to reverse the decision on the six games. Because they can't. It's, it's their policy that they right. came up with as a result of Ray Rice and all the backlash that G Goodell got for only giving him two games in the first place. And this is really, you know, what is this, the second or third high profile player that, ha that has come under this yeah. policy. And if he reduces it, or Harold Henderson reduces it to four games or two games, it just totally undermines the policy that Goodell put forth to begin with. So to me, there was no, there was no way that was going to get overturned. Yeah, I realize not every, not everyone is up on all the facts. I, I you know, we speak in tunnel vision sometimes. Yeah. Ezekiel Elliott, uh, star running back for the Cowboys, uh, involved in some domestic disputes with his, I don't know if it was even a girlfriend. I think it was girlfriend in summer of 2016. It took a year for the NFL to do an investigation, a 160-page report came up with a, a fair number of instances of abuse and a six-game suspension for Elliott that was appealed. And last night, the appeal was upheld, uh, which we'll talk about on the legalese uh, after you have to go. But <clears throat> this is a, uh, you know, six games in the NFL is what I know, 40-something percent of the season. It's a harsh penalty, uh, and as Ashley mentioned, there were no criminal charges. But as I mentioned, it just is really sticky right now because, again, what the NFLPA, what Ezekiel Elliott's lawyers were focusing in on is the lack of credibility of the girl. Um, and that is really some really dangerous territory. Uh, so I just think that um, it's become an issue in sports. And the reason it has is probably the Ray Rice video. It's hard to know what else would have made it the issue that it has. But as you can attest to, you know personally or you suspected these domestic violence issues did not all of a sudden come into focus once Ray Rice video came out, right? I mean, this. This has been happening a long time, and we're back to media where everything's out there now where it didn't used to be. That's right. Well, and the victim shaming part of it yeah. was a bad look um, for the NFLPA, which that was basically, you know, 
and, and Elliot's side right. was to do that. But then, you know, I mean, I don't think the league looks great either because, you know, Roger Goodell ignored the input of his lead investigator, who happens to be a female. But so I don't know. I think, I think the other issue, or I mean, there's so many, but yeah. um, is, you know, you're talking about the powers of the commissioner. And I mean, the players in the NFL gave him the power that he has to hand down these punishments that he does. It's Article 46 in the CBA. As I'm sure you could recite from memory, right. probably. And that's going to be, you know, a major sticking point in three years when the CBA is back up because the right. players hate it, but they're the ones who gave it to them. And the courts, I don't think, have at least in the Tom Brady case said, you know, you gave him, he's got the power to do what he wants to do with great latitude. Right. So that's why I also, I mean, I think if the courts were to overturn it now, they would have to basically, they would be rewriting the CBA, as I understand right. it, right? So it's complicated. Yeah, I mean, the domestic violence issue is one where we're probably going to be talking about this a lot in the future. Um, some people would feel it's going to bring, bring more accusations. Um, some people feel that it's something that should not, leagues should not be involved with. It just leave it to the, the federal authorities, the state and local authorities. Um, but it's a huge marketing issue as well. It's the business of sports. You don't want your product to be associated with uh, mistreatment of women. Um, so it's, like I said, a legal issue, a business issue, a policy issue that all sort of rolls into now this Dallas Cowboys Ezekiel Elliott case, who, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit, who is going to play while he's suspended. So that, that's another <laughs> layer of complications. Sunday night football uh, against the Giants. Yeah, again, the High business football. interests, mm -hmm. uh, the Sunday night football game. Um, in her little remaining time, any questions about these topics for Ashley or even about her career or about anything you want to ask? Anyone? Anyone interested in sports media? Smart. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, was the, what was your single biggest memory covering sports here in Philadelphia? My single biggest. Um, there were so many, you know. I mean, I covered the Sixers run when they played the Lakers in the NBA Finals, when the Eagles went to the Super Bowl and played the Patriots in 2004. Um, I was always, like, just amazed by how misunderstood the city was from a national perspective. Yeah. And I'm not a native here, but I've grown to, like, I've lived here for almost 20 years. And um, it gets such a bad rap nationally for having, like, you know, <laughs> fans that throw batteries at Santa or snowballs or whatever it is. But the fans are, like, great, in my opinion. <laughs> and, they, and all they want is for the athletes to play as hard and up to their potential as they can. That's why Brian Dawkins was beloved and why Iverson was beloved. And T.O., I always said, and I tried to make this argument to him after he, things blew up here, he goes and plays in the Super Bowl in 2004 off, on a broken leg, basically, and has, what was it, 11 catches for 127 yeah. yards. They lose the game, but then he ends up blowing up the whole thing over a couple of million dollars, which, had he just come back here, he could have made up that difference, just in local endorsements alone. And he would have, because he was, he, he was like mythical proportions yeah. at that point. Um, so that was one of the things, like if you could have a do-over on what you were able to see, um, I wish that they would have, he would have stayed. Because I think if he would have stayed, they still had a good enough team that at some point they would have won a Super Bowl. And I would love to see what would happen in this city if that happens. You know, they haven't won a world championship since 1960. They've only played in two Super Bowls, 1980 and 2004. And I just would like to see it. And I don't know. I don't know if we ever will. 
<laughs> so, or in my lifetime at least. Thoughts on the Sixers and what they're doing? The tanking? Well, it's, we'll the see. Tanking's I mean, if, over, it seems like. If yeah. Joel Embiid stays healthy, then it will have worked. But, I mean, I know it was super painful for the three years that it was going on. I mean, when I covered the Sixers, the, the arena in the city was sold out, you know, standing room only every single night, whether it was November or June. And uh, it was fun. It was really fun. <laughs> but it, hadn't, it had not been like that in a really long time. So, yep. Okay, I just had a question. Um, I, when it comes to, like, this case with Ricky Gillespie, mm -hmm. um, would you say, which one do you think Ray is more? Because I've always been unsure of this. When, you know, Ray Rice is that instance with a big high profile case, um, but like the Josh Brown case where kind of the NFL had struggled and made a terrible decision with that one, even though that was more low profile, but they made a bigger mistake in that mm -hmm. one, do you think that way is more? in the decision-making with Ezekiel Elliott and down the line now than the actual Ray Rice case? I don't know if anything weighs more than the Ray Rice case because there was the video. I mean, I personally think if there had been a video for what Greg Hardy did to the girl in Charlotte, um, that he, he would have never gotten another shot with the Cowboys, but there wasn't a video. There, was, there were pictures eventually, and there was like the description of what he did. But he like threw her on a futon with guns on it. He, he shoved her head into a um, toilet bowl. Like he, he grabbed her by like a necklace that she was wearing. I mean, he did, and, and she was, you know, the photos eventually showed, that, that eventually came out showed she was black and blue. But the video of Ray Rice hitting her and her falling to the ground. And then the way he just walked away from her mm -hmm. and didn't look, didn't even, in the video, didn't look like he was concerned at all. Dragged her out of the elevator. Dragged her out. I mean, that to me isn't someone who, that's the first time they've done that, right? Because like, let's say, let's say you get in, a, in an argument and something happens and you know, you hit me. Like, I would think that your reaction would be, oh my God, what have I done? Right, like, oh, I, I can't believe I did that. But that wasn't it. So, and not, it's not to discount the other, the, the other issue that you brought up, but I think the power of that video has driven everything in terms of what they're trying to do. Because they don't want another one of those, in my opinion. I mean, they have, and they have lots of issues they're dealing with, you know, I mean, their ratings have gone down, there's been a lot of discussion about why their ratings went down, you know, was the presidential race last year, you know, CBS, I think, just did a, or released a study that they think that it's because of all the anthem protests, you know, Kaepernick and everybody else, um, so I don't think they're worried about losing money or losing fans, but there's a lot of evidence out there that they should be. So they don't want to get the Ezekiel Elliott thing wrong or make it look like they're, they don't care, in my opinion. Yeah, I think the Josh Brown your thing you're talking about with the Giants, everything I heard about that, well, again, it's no one knows for sure, but it sounded like it was non, if you, if you believe what this is, non-physical abuse. So whatever that means. So um, if so, I mean. But that's why you get, you know, the, the light punishment there, I suppose. But again, everything's now with social media and media reaction. As you remember, if you're a Giants fan, Josh Brown was supported by the, the Giants. And all of a sudden, people like us <laughs> are getting down on them and all over the country. And... They released them. Well, and Ray Rice was supported by Ray's the Ravens. Ray's supported by the Ravens. Certainly, and Zeke is being supported by the Cowboys. And in a lot of these instances, I mean, it's, it's 
I've always said the NFL is a sliding scale for morality. Right. Right. So the better the player, the more leeway and, and patience you have. And so, I mean, if I was looking at it as the Cowboys GM slash owner, I mean, I'd probably be pretty patient with Ezekiel Elliott too. I mean, he's their most important player on offense, and you can make the argument he's their most important player on defense too because he keeps the defense off the field. So, um, and I don't know how much fan backlash there's been on it. It doesn't sound like a whole, whole lot from what I know. There have been videos and stories of Zeke doing other things. Uh, mm -hmm. Pulling his girl shirt down. Do you think if those things weren't public and out there, the NFL might have hid behind the, um, the fact that nothing criminal has ever done about this? But there's other stuff about Zeke that contributes to his character issues. Yeah. That's a good point. It's a, it's a great question, and I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I think there's been a lot of damaging stuff that's come out about him. I mean, that he uses cocaine or has used cocaine, that the girl, he encouraged her to get an abortion, which she did. I mean, there's all sorts of ugliness around the story. Um, what's true, what's not, I don't know. I, I would like to think that they know more than is out there in the public domain. I'm not sure that's true. I'm not sure it isn't, but. Um, well, like you said, it took a year, and. Um, and he did not cooperate. He did not cooperate. I mean, the thing about it is we're back to video. So there's video at, I think it was a St. Patrick's Day parade, where he's pulling down a girl's shirt and feeling her breast in, in a video. So what I talked to the, uh, one of the lawyers about it, I'm like, is that part of this? You know, is that part of the six games? And his words were, again, lawyers, lawyers talk like lawyers. <laughs> he said, no, but it, it has probative value. Uh, so probative value, I think, means we're not giving him a suspension uh, partly based on that. But in the totality of circumstances, there's another legal phrase, uh, it matters that he would, I think the lawyer even told me that he would treat women like that matters in the grand scheme of things. And I think things like that, what you mentioned, is exactly what the NFL is trying to change the image of. Uh, maybe even more than all this stuff out there that's not you know, proven or not proven, when there's video of a star player pulling a woman's uh, blouse down, they got to get ahead of that. So imagine if, if they gave no suspension for the other things to Elliot, and then there's that video floating around about what he did there. So I guess what we're saying is, and, and like Rice, not obviously as, as dynamic as Rice, but some really uh, importance of video evidence. Because it's, it's reaction, right? It's, it's the visceral reaction to video. It's amazing. All right, I have to go. I'm sorry. OK. Thank you, guys. She's got to pick up her kid. Thanks so much. We'll just segue right there. And we have Jason and Jeff, Jeff are going to talk about it. Kind of where we, what just happened. Uh, and a lot just happened. Again, I gave you the quick background. Star running back for the Cowboys. This was a year ago, right? So this was summer of 2016. Incidents with his then girlfriend, and it's led to a dramatic uh, actions by the commissioner, which are now being all being disputed in various forms. So, did you guys? Which one want to talk about it? I can start. Okay. Commissioner Goodell on the punishment, um, so that was upheld. 
not the judge. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The, the, judge, the, the arbitrator. The arbitrator. Right. And there's, um, there's kind of a little controversy on whether or not he's you know, colluding with the league or not, which is what Elliot's lawyers allege later on. But they also filed in Texas, um, the Eastern District Court of Texas, um, a temporary restraining order um, against the suspension. And the league last night after that filed um, to change venue, and they filed to kind of hold the suspension in New York, which is where uh, Tom Brady was uh, speaking to the league was. Um, we kind of talked about uh, the investigators. I think that's another important factor in this. Um, the league has appointed an investigator is one of only two people to interview the victim, or um, the accuser, and she found the accuser to not be credible, and she said that her and along with the Columbus Police Department both kind of had the same findings about the credibility, and she was actually barred from the meeting uh, with Commissioner Goodell where they kind of reported what the investigation found. Um, and that's the basis of what the NFLPA um, and their lawyer, Jeffrey Kessler, is saying that Goodell wasn't given um, information that would have exonerated Elliot. Um, they, they're alleging that this is a conspiracy um, against him and the Cowboys. And uh, we'll see what happens. It's a temporary restraining order that's going to come out Friday. Okay, a lot of bitterness, a lot of going on both sides, Jeff. The investigator, Mrs. Roberts, Kia Roberts, yeah. And I think it seems like the record seems to be that it's being trailed. Um, so everybody's alleging that. And how this is pretty much like a unilateral decision that we were learning about in the previous class about you know, the question of can the commissioner kind of just make the decision for himself. And it seems like that is the case until this um, temporary restraining order and then the appeal uh, plays itself out. Okay. So a lot to unpack here. I think just based on our conversation with Ashley, you have to understand context. Uh, you know, I don't know where you guys were three years ago today, uh, but that's when the video came out. Ray Rice was suspended two games before that for acts with his th uh, then fiance. Um, we hadn't seen. We had seen one video at that time of him pulling her off an elevator at the Revel in Atlantic City, and on September 8th, was it, I guess we're a couple of days away from three years from now, but uh, on September 8th, 2014, we saw the second video, right? So that's the punch video. And everything changed, everything changed. Uh, we had, as I mentioned, the NFL realized they hadn't done it right. As Ashley talked about, no women in the room, no women in the decision-making process. Lisa Friel, who I've mentioned before, is now one of the senior VPs at the NFL. She was hired away from the DA's office in Manhattan. She ran sex crimes. Think about that hire. Uh, that's a very prestigious job in the Manhattan DA. Who knows how much money she made, how much authority she had. And she was all of a sudden whisked away by the NFL, hired. Uh, Cynthia Hogan is a woman that drafted the Women Against Violence Act in the 90s. She was all of a sudden hired by the NFL, whisked away from Capitol Hill. So, and domestic violence counselors were hired uh, to sort of assist the teams and go out to the teams and talk to these players about what you can and can't do, what you should or shouldn't do in regards to women. It became an issue that was league-wide priority. Uh, and listen, we can sit here and debate why. But we know, right? We know. PR, um, it was a firestorm three years ago, an absolute firestorm. Count, count that with, we uh, Ashley mentioned Greg Hardy, another star player, beating his girlfriend in the same time frame. And then we had pictures of the, one of the true stars in the, in the whole sport of Adrian Peterson with uh, pictures of his young son having uh, sticks across his backside uh, as domestic punishment for misbehavior. 
It was a firestorm. And again, covering this business of sports, I saw what was going on. We had not only uh, we had women broadcasters saying they don't think they can cover the game anymore. We had uh, sponsors pulling out locally. The Radisson in Minneapolis, where Peterson played, pulled their banner from the press conference stage. Uh, and then maybe most impactful of all, we had Anheuser-Busch, the league's biggest advertiser, not say they were pulling out, so they didn't go that far. They just made a statement, like, this is not good, right? <laughs> we got a problem here, as if it was a precursor to something where they'd say they're going to pull some advertising, but they didn't. That's when it all changed, right? So that's when uh, Ray Rice was indefinitely suspended. Okay, so he had two games, and all of a sudden, no, no, not two games, indefinitely. Indefinitely. Adrian Peterson, indefinitely. Greg Hardy, indefinitely. They were placed on something called a commissioner exemplist, which got them paid, but off the field. And talking to someone close to this, they said there was no way in God's green earth they were going to let those three players be on the field that year. Because imagine that. You turn on the games and there's that guy playing. After what they did, that's very public. So whatever it took, and what it took was this cockamamie list. Give them their money, keep them away. Now, Rice is a whole different story. Rice went through litigation, was actually exonerated. Uh, the suspension was lifted. But that was a pyrrhic victory for Ray Rice, as everyone knows, because three years later, he's never played it down again. And he never will. It's too late now. So uh, that's the backdrop. And now we have it. Again, one of the su superstars of the league uh, on the highest profile team. Uh, a year-long investigation and the six games. So what Jason and Jeff have talked about is this bickering between the league and the, the union. The union represents Elliot. Let's start here. Why is the union representing Elliot? Why is the union representing Rice? Assume that they did what they are said to have done to these women. Should the union be even taking their case? Any thoughts there? Yes. Tell me your name. Nick. Nick Morello, right. In general, the union is probably worried about commissioners over, you know, power and uh, having to Yeah, I mean, Nix makes the point. It's the greater good, right? So you may despise what Rice did or what Elliot did or said, was said to have done. But if you're working as a lawyer <laughs> for the group that represents these players collectively, we're going to talk a lot about unions here in sports. You're, it's all about the greater good. And if the commissioner is being overreaching, you as a lawyer have to say, OK, we're going to fight that, even though the client is not a sympathetic one. These are tough choices way beyond this class. You know about these, where lawyers have to represent people that may be really antithetical to what their own personal views are. Okay, The ultimate example of what Nick is talking about is <clears throat> the Aaron Hernandez example in uh, New England. The union is fighting for his money. Okay, he was convicted of murder. Uh, he's now since uh, committed suicide. Um, this is the tight end for the Patriots that was convicted of murder. <laughs> um, he's owed money. Now it's his estate that's owed money from the Patriots. The Patriots have denied paying for three, four years. Uh, this is a case. And some of you could be saying, how in the world is the union representing Aaron Hernandez? Um, it's what 
what you do. It's about a bigger cause. Because you could say well, no team can get away with not paying what's due on a contract. And that's what this is about. No matter what Aaron Hernandez did after he agreed to this contract, he's owed the money. Now, we can get into the whole discussion of morals clauses. That usually comes with endorsements. Uh, and had the money been future money for Hernandez, it would have been a big problem. <clears throat> but this is part of his bonus money, which was basically a bonus is for, for being on the team, which he was at the time. So he's owed the money. But the Patriots won't pay it. They just won't. And here comes the union. And you know what? They're right. They're right to fight it. As unsympathetic a client as you could ever have shot a man in cold blood, uh, you have to fight for it. Any questions on that? OK, back to Elliot. Um, so again, to, to expound on what Jeff and Jason have said, here is the issue. Elliot's suspended six games. We're sort of jumping ahead to what we're going to talk about with collective bargaining agreements. But the collective bargaining agreement in, football, in the NFL says you have a process. And the process is to go through the system. He had an appeal right. Okay? He had an appeal of his six-game suspension. He had a lawyer. He had an NFLPA lawyer. He had his own lawyer. He had an outside criminal lawyer, defense lawyer. He had an appeal. It was just last week. He had an appeal. Three days. It took three days. A week ago, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Over the holiday weekend, the appeal hearing officer, a guy named Harold Henderson, who's worked at the league a long time, made a decision to affirm the suspension. Six-game suspension upheld. That's the end of his recourse under the collective bargaining agreement. It's over. You can't appeal that. So he had his appeal of a six-game suspension. The appeal was denied. The suspension was upheld. End of story. Except <laughs> the union and, and Zeke Elliott's lawyers say, no, not end of story. We're going to court. Which, what we're going to talk about in this class is an extraordinary idea that you can go to court outside of the system. Because what we have in, in a lot of sports law is about the system. It's about the collective bargaining agreement. It's about the procedures in the system. Tom Brady has provided a roadmap to go outside the system. And Ezekiel Elliott is trying to do the same. He has filed with a friendly court, we assume, since it's right outside of Dallas, a friendly court to hopefully say to the NFL, no, you can't do that, and then have a case about it forever while he plays. That's their hope. So what they filed in this Texas court, which was heard last night, was a temporary restraining order to allow him to play while a bigger case will be filed, Ezekiel Elliott versus Roger Goodell, about commissioner power. Right now, it's not the big case. It's just an application for an injunction for the NFL to not be able to impose the suspension. Right? So in that case, last night, the judge says to the NFL lawyers, well, what are you guys going to do about this week? This week against the Giants. And the lawyers for the NFL trying to please the court, <laughs> the judge trying to get on his good side, said, Your Honor, he can play this week. He can play this week. Because you're going to be considering this TRO the next few days. And it's just too much going on. He can play this week. That's why it happened. This is all about the legal case where the, the NFL lawyers said, yeah, he'll play. It's OK. 
If we have a suspension, it'll go weeks two through seven instead of one through six. So we can all have our own conspiracy thoughts about Sunday night football and the Giants and whatever. But I think that's, it's as simple as that. They're in a legal proceeding right now. They're trying to butter up the judge. And the judge wants to know what's going on this week. And the NFL said, well, yeah, he can play. No worries. Now, between today and Friday, the judge is considering whether to grant the TRO to Elliott and the union to allow the suspension to drop while a bigger case about it will be filed. And as Jason mentioned, midnight last night, the NFL files in New York, which is a friendly jurisdiction for them, to confirm the suspension, which would trump, I know that's a sketchy word, but which would overcome whatever's going on in Texas and eventually combine the cases if it goes to a case in Texas. I know this is complicated. What we have in Texas is a TRO request. What we have in New York is a request for a judge in New York to confirm the suspension judicially and be the forum if there's a bigger case just like the NFL did for Tom Brady. Exact replica of that. So we have the system, which is CBA, ruling by the commissioner, six games, appeal, six games affirmed. That's the end. No more appeal rights for Elliott. He's done in the NFL system. So knowing that, he and his lawyers say, well, we're going to go outside the NFL which is exactly why I'm predicting the judge will say, get out of here. What are you, crazy? You just had your system litigate your case. You can't come to, come to court. But what Elliot's, uh, Elliot's people will argue is, yes, we can, because it was, here's the two words, fundamentally unfair because the process that the NFL put us through with Roger Goodell and with his appointee, Harold Henderson, was fundamentally unfair. Why was it fundamentally unfair? Because of this investigator that Jeff mentioned. And we referenced it with Ashley. We had a woman that works for the NFL interview the complaining witness with Elliot. She interviewed her several times. She found the woman to be not credible. She reported that to her bosses at the NFL, like Lisa Friel, who I've mentioned. Her bosses also reported that to Commissioner Goodell, but her bosses also said to Commissioner Goodell, we believe this, 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 and there was a six-game suspension. The NFL will say, we understand that one of our investigators had that opinion. We had other investigators that did not share that opinion. And we had a lot of people suggesting this was worthy of a six-game suspension. OK. Should Elliot have a case? We're taking you way ahead in the semester. But the answer should be no. You can't take it out of the system. We even saw this last week with Pete Rose. Right? Pete Rose tried to take commissioner discipline out of the system into the Cincinnati courts, which would be very friendly to him as a local hometown team. Elliot's trying to do the same thing. Now, we'll know by Friday. If he has success, I'd be surprised. The only thing going for him is this you know, information about this complaining witness being not credible. And they're sort of emails or texts with their friends about blackmailing him. Again, this is dirty. This is really messy. Because in all this stuff is also about drug use and also about her use of Molly and also about her getting an abortion. I mean, it's just, it's just nasty. But this is what happens when you get in a fight about commissioner power where the person, Elliot, is fighting for his football life when it's six out of 16 games, which is a lot. 
So as sports lawyers, we look at this and we say, okay, the big issue here is commissioner power, but a real issue here is labor law. Okay, labor law says you got a system like this, that should be it. Okay, that should be it. I've referenced Brady. I'm saving Brady because we're going to talk about it. It has become, in the brief from the NFL last night or two nights ago, I don't even know, they referenced the Brady case six times. You talk about precedent. Not the NFLPA, not the union, not, not Elliott's side, the league side, the commissioner side. They love the Brady precedent. Love it even though two years ago the Brady precedent was for the other side, for those of you who followed. Okay, so it is now in the news. This is right when it's happening. The Elliott case, again, Commissioner Power, look at what is happening. In the past three years, Commissioner has pissed off maybe the two most important franchises in the sport. The Patriots were livid about this. The Cowboys are livid about this. The one thing you can say about Commissioner Goodell is he does not play favorites. And for those conspiracy theorists out there, why would you take the two biggest stars in your game and put them off the field? That is a terrible business decision. To remove Tom Brady from your games? remove Ezekiel Elliott and the star power they bring? Come on. So I will say this about Goodell. He doesn't, you know, he's not beholden to anyone. This is a major deal to take these two guys off the field like this. Okay, we talk about, again, ratings down last year, or the first half of the season. Well, Brady wasn't playing. That's part of it. That's part of it. There were like three or four New England primetime games where he wasn't in there. That's a big part of it. And there were two uh, presidential debates against Sunday night and Monday night football. Yeah, of course they're down. That's not happening this year, as far as we know, right? <laughs> we don't know what's going to happen. Um, OK, so I think the important thing that we're going to see is this is going to play out next week. We're going to be here next week, Wednesday, and either Ezekiel Elliott's going to be suspended the next six weeks, or he's going to be getting ready to play whoever the Cowboys play next week. And we're going to have a complete surprise, at least according to Brandt, that he got a TRO. Because the TRO is the end of the line if it's denied, right? Now, he can bring a bigger case against Goodell. But that'll take years or months, years, and he won't be playing. But the TRO is the end of the line about holding up the suspension, right? If that's denied, he has lost in the NFL court of law, and he's lost in the real court of law. And speaking of courts of, what about court of public opinion? This is where I, it really gets messy. Do we support commissioner discipline here, knowing that Elliot did not have any criminal charges? Do we support that? Or do we think, as a lot of people did in the past about Goodell, that he's been overreached? He overreached here. He went too far. Based on everything I've told you about the right th last three years, what do, what do we think of this? Anyone? Jack. I think the public probably wants the best players on the field. And I know coming off the Tom Brady suspension, everybody was incredibly unhappy with Roger Goodell generally. So I can just imagine that there's no serious legal action taken against the community. Why not off the field for longer, especially in such a big market? Again, back to Ray Rice. Everyone was saying from the league side, league side was saying when he got two games, he's, and everyone was saying, well, the law didn't do anything, right? I had the judge in class, the judge in Atlantic City whose son graduated here, 
Donio, who granted Ray Rice what was called pretrial intervention. No jail time, nothing like that. Law didn't do anything. Why would the NFL do more than two game suspension? That's what everyone was saying. That was the public discourse. Then the video, right? Then the video, it all changed. Here we are again. The law, Columbus, Ohio, said nothing. We're not charging them. And what I tell people all the time is first thing I told you guys, there's the law, there's how things work, and then there's how sports works. <laughs> and the NFL said, screw the law. We've got our own law. And again, nothing happens in a vacuum. We're two years, three years removed from that video. Things have changed. All these people, I keep mentioning Lisa Friel in the NFL office. Lisa Friel is one of the most powerful people at the NFL. So when you, see, when you hear that, there is quite a directive about this issue. What's her background? Sex crimes. OK, once again, Columbus, Ohio, no charges. NFL, 40% of his income. Not just income, it's, his, it's playing, right? That's what athletes want to do, they want to play. Any other thoughts? Do we think that leagues should be held to whatever the law enforcement does? What's your reaction when you hear the Columbus investigation, nothing happened? Jason. He does have bosses too, it's all the owners. And if he starts, you know, making decisions that not necessarily cost the money, but alienate them in a way, uh, his job could be on the line eventually. Well, interesting, in the backdrop of all this, we're hearing that Commissioner Goodell is uh, getting an extension, like for $30 million a year or whatever he makes. Um, so that's kind of a backdrop. I think what you made is a point I make a lot, as much as one owner like Jones or Kraft hates him for the time being. I think they'll get over it. All these other ones are probably saying, go get them. You know, good job. Atta boy. Go get the Cowboys. Because everybody's got self-interest, right? I can tell you this, as someone who worked for an NFL team, every team, every team, without a doubt, thinks that the commissioner treats other teams better than them. We certainly did. Every team thinks that. It's like every sibling thinks their parents treat other siblings better than them. It's just what we all are. We're universally paranoid. <laughs> I think that happens. That's happening here. A lot of these owners have thought that Commissioner Goodell treated the Patriots better. Maybe no longer. A lot of people have thought that Commissioner Goodell treated the Cowboys better than other teams. Maybe no longer.
Do you think the Ezekiel punishment would be different if he was a no-name player? What do you think? Yeah, probably. The, the devil probably just thinking if you can keep it out of the news cycle for two weeks or three weeks, I mean, it's job well done. And I think that um, as much as we all know about Ezekiel, I don't think the average person in America, they may know a little bit about it, um, but if he didn't hand out a six-game suspension, they'd know about it. Right. Unless there was video. <laughs> right. Good point. And maybe we didn't touch on that enough. Again, one of the things out of the Ray Rice was a new policy. Six game baseline for domestic violence. Now again, it has this tagline, mitigating circumstances could be less, could be more. So he's not beholden to six games, but that's certainly where this one ended up. All right, good discussion. Big case going on right now, sports law in the news every day. Uh, we'll come back, talk a little more about that, but get into this whole idea of commissioners and team decisions. Uh, so we've talked about Ray Rice. Who's talking about that? Your name is? Pat. Pat. Okay, so if you can supplement that, and we'll just sort of, again, review how we got to where we are. Yeah, so the video that he's that the incident is most famous for didn't come out right away. It, it actually came out much later than the process was started with the video um, of him dragging his then fiance out of the elevator. Uh, and they went through the process over the couple months. At first, the team really, really stood by him. Uh, you had personnel from the team saying what a good guy he was. He met with uh, Roger Bell, and that's the point where he was first in the two-game suspension where a lot of the commissioner power issue arises because uh, over the next couple months, um, it's the video comes out, a really horrible video, graphic video of him punching her twice, and there's a whole lot of dispute about whether or not Ray Rice was telling Goodell the truth and the lead the truth in this meeting. Ultimately, Goodell takes the stance that he indefinitely suspends Ray Rice because there were conflicting stories uh, against what the video showed, but down the line, um, during his appeal, Ray Rice won because it comes out that he had been telling the truth the whole entire time. So this was the long short that it was completely botched by the league and really definitely an ugly mark on Goodell's legacy. Yeah, what Pat's talking about is the hearing where Goodell and Ashley talked about it, no women in the room, and Janae Rice, the den girlfriend, now wife, who you see there, was sitting in the hearing room with, uh, again, all these people, including the commissioner, and forced to talk about it, not forced, but asked to talk about it in front of, uh, in front of Ray and in front of everyone else. Uh, it just came out as... Pat said kind of a comedy of errors in the way they handled it. Uh, so again, given the two-game suspension during the summer, the video comes out September 8th. Within an hour, he was given a, a, an indefinite suspension. So now we get to the lawyers. The NFLPA, you can make the argument again. Why would they represent someone who did this to this woman on video? Well, again, about the greater good. So the NFLPA takes the case of Ray Rice. And in this case, unlike maybe any we've ever seen, Commissioner Goodell assigns, oh, he has the ability to be the hearing officer. Uh, like we just saw with Elliot, he assigned it to Harold Henderson, who's a league lawyer. But in this case, he decided to bring in an independent arbitrator. It's a former judge uh, named Jones. So Judge Jones, Barbara Jones, former judge, like a real judge, not just someone who dealt with sports leagues, uh, and she presided over the appeal. And the appeal was basically Ray Rice arguing double jeopardy, that he had been disciplined two games for the exact thing that he told them he did. 
and then he's being disciplined indefinitely, much harsher, for the same thing. So what this came, what, what was all talked about in this appeal was, did he tell the commissioner that he punched her? And in this odd twist, it was better for him to have said, yes, I told her, him I punched her. Because then he's punch, he's, he gave the two games for the punch, which was the exact same thing he gave the indefinite suspension for. So the double jeopardy argument won. And Judge Jones, this independent judge who, who Goodell chose, why did the Goodell do this? Why did he not give it to one of his people? Why did he not take this case himself? Why do anyone think he gave this to an independent judge? Anyone? Because he was a witness. Because he was a witness. He was in the room, and the, the key testimony was, did you, Ray Rice, tell the commissioner and his group that you punched her? So Goodell was a witness. And I think his testimony was, well, he said something about he glanced her or her head hit the, the banister in the elevator or whatever it was. And the judge did not believe Goodell. He, she believed Ray Rice. Suspension overturned. But as I told, told you earlier, that is a legal victory, that it was not a practical victory. Because here we are with the Kaepernick discussion again. It's been three years. No one has given Ray Rice a chance to play football. No one. Not even a tryout. Not even a tryout. For one of the best players at one point in the league. So there's legal and academic, and then there's reality. Now from our point of view, the Ray Rice was a huge victory for Rice, a huge victory for the players, because they got an independent judge to say, in the system that he was in, in the CBA system, that you're right, you shouldn't have been suspended more than the two games you were. You're right. And as of that moment that she, Judge Jones, rejected the suspension, he was free to sign. That was October 2014, 35 months ago. Hasn't signed. Judge can't do that, right? Judge can't tell a team to sign a player. But a judge can overrule a suspension. So Ray Rice, uh, and that picture there is what Ashley was talking about. And this is where I think Adele gets too much heat. The Ravens, the Ravens, they supported Rice a lot more than the league. They, they did no discipline, right? The league did two games. Ravens did zero discipline. Teams are allowed to discipline, right? They don't have to wait for the commissioner. Teams are allowed to do this. They did zero, and they had a press conference <coughs> supporting him. They were behind him. They were 100% behind him until the video. Because the hour after the video, not only did the league give him an indefinite suspension, the Ravens cut him. Done. Finished. All that love and support they gave him, as soon as the video came out, over. As I said, it was a seminal moment in the history of sports law because it changed. It changed the way people, uh, leagues react to domestic violence, but it changed the way leagues react to discipline. It's part of a changed world we live in with social media with everyone, everyone's got a phone. I mean, everyone's got a camera, right? Everyone's got a camera. And then, of course, you've got this uh, failing casino in Las Vegas, uh, Atlantic City, which has cameras everywhere. 
right? Any, any of you ever been to a casino? Everywhere you look, there's cameras. So yeah, they're going to capture what Ray Rice and his wife were doing that night in, pub, in the public space. And again, reiterating, I had, uh, as a guest in my class that year, I had Judge Donio. Judge Donio is the Atlanta County judge who is, gets on his lap the Ray Rice pretrial intervention uh, recommendation. Who was that recommendation from? The prosecutor. So the prosecutor, as he told it, gave him a file this big, and what did it have in it? Anyone know, anyone know? It had a statement from owner of the Ravens, Steve Bashotti, general manager of the Ravens, Ozzie Newsom, coach of the Ravens, John Harbaugh, city leaders for Baltimore, YMCA group leader, Baltimore, Disadvantaged youth uh, leader, Baltimore, all saying what a great guy Ray Rice was. Prosecutor gets this. You guys may know criminal law better than I do, but says, what do I do? Am I going to send this guy to jail for one punch with no history? Recommends pretrial diversion. Pretrial diversion goes to the judge. The judge says, do you recommend this, you the prosecutor? I mean, the judge caught a lot of heat for this, a lot of public heat. And he just said, I just did what the prosecutor asked. Judge just puts his stamp on it. Ray Rice walks down the hall in Atlantic County Courthouse meets with the pretrial diversion people. They say, OK, we're going to do uh, marital counseling, drug testing, show up here every couple months to check in. End of story. So we go back to the NFL. They're proud, at least, of being law and order that they gave two games for something that Atlantic City said, you're good. So we have this constant push and pull between what the legal system is doing and what these individual uh, leagues are doing. And it really comes back to commissioner power. And a lot of what we talk about with player incidents is really tends to be around the NFL. Why? It's what I've written about and talked about. We have a commissioner that really believes in this. We may think it's archaic. We may think it's fuddy-duddy. We may think this guy is really out of touch. But he has this incredible view of athletes as role models back to his core. That's why we're talking about all this. That's why we're talking about Zeke Elliott. And that's why I think that pulling down that woman's uh, blouse is so important. Because he has this real image of athletes. And if they're not the role models he wants them to be, he's going to be tough. I don't think other commissioners necessarily feel that way. I don't think other business leaders necessarily feel that way. I don't think a lot of team owners necessarily feel that way. And more importantly, I guess, I don't think a lot of fans feel that way. I think a lot of parents do, because our kids look up to these athletes. But I think a lot of fans are like, they have lives. Let them do what they do. The league shouldn't get involved in moral in behavior. 
and that's a fundamental issue in sports law. Should your team, your league, your owner get involved in your personal life? It was never an issue before like 10 years ago. And now it's a big issue, Khalil. Um, we mentioned before that you know, commissioners work for the owners, right? And we have this case here with Ray Rice where the owner didn't do anything with Ray Rice. He was allowed to continue play. Um, same thing with Jones and the league, right? But then we also have the public profession. And we mentioned before that these um, commissioners, they don't work for the fans at all. When does that kind of change? Is it all, does it get to the point where it's like, okay, well, now this is messing with the shield of the NFL or the money that we're going to start thinking about the fans in this aspect? Or I think that's a big part of it. I think the business aspect, I pointed to that comment from Anheuser-Busch. Like if they started pulling advertising, even the threat or the thought of that, wow. I mean, Anheuser-Busch, hundreds of millions of dollars on these broadcasts. Um, so. I think that's it. But I think you have to decide as a fan. I mean, if you're a Cowboys fan right now, or you are a Ravens fan, do you want your owner supporting this player? If you're a Cowboys fan and you see that, that Jerry Jones is livid about this, how do you feel about that? I mean, I know there are the Yahoo fans out there that just want to know, is Zeke going to play in their fantasy league? I mean, forget those people. <laughs> what we're talking about is, how do you feel about this? Tell me your name. Ashley. Ashley. Yeah. I think a lot of the time, it's probably more due to Ezekiel Elliott case as opposed to the Ray Rice where there was video footage. I think a lot of the time when you have fans that are really passionate about that, they kind of make themselves believe Type right. Scenario, they make themselves believe that he did it. I mean, whether he did or not, like they convince themselves that he's innocent, that he didn't do anything. And what do you think of those fans? <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not a Cowboys fan. I'm a Eagles fan, so I don't think much of this at all. But right. But is it is it that though? Is it your team? We don't have to mention a name on the Eagles, but if that happened to an Eagles player, and you'd be your only concern is is that guy going to play? Would that be your only concern? Or would you feel like, no, I'm an Eagles fan, but I want that guy disciplined because of image role modeling? I mean, that's a tough, that's a tough question. Everyone's got their own self-interest, right? But um, these are bigger issues. What do you stand for, I guess is my question. What does Jerry Jones stand for if he's supporting the player like this? Yeah. Whitehead. Right. Right. I'll tell you the story that sticks with me, for the, especially with these topics. Um, I just remember sitting in Green Bay. I'm in a seat like this with a coach, our defensive line coach. Um, defensive line, I could write a whole book about. That's just, I just had a lot of problems with defensive linemen. Just, just. And he's saying, we should bring in this guy. And I look at him and I say, hey, this guy has a rap sheet a block long, drunk and disorderly, violent assault, sexual assault, inappropriate touching, groping. And I'm, I'm looking at him, and I'm like, we can't. We just can't. There's no way in God's green earth we can bring this guy into rural Wisconsin, 
with this. And he looked at me, and I'll never forget this. He says to me, Andrew, what do you think we're asking him to do? I said, what do you mean? What do you think we're asking this guy to do? What do you mean? We're not asking him to teach sixth grade. We're not asking him to run a boys choir. And I just looked at him, and he goes, here's what we want him to do. And now he's getting you know, hyped up, this guy. You know, coaches, they get, they get hyped up. He's like, we want him to come in here and get into 70 street fights every game, every play, every practice, and win. And win. We want him to be violent. And I'm just astounded. I'm like, yeah, but he's got to turn off that violence. He's got to turn it off. He can't turn it off. Look at this. He can't turn it off. And, then, and he would say, he can turn it off. I said, I'm looking at a rap sheet. He can't turn it off. He goes, he'll be fine. So we had to go to the general manager and present our cases. And that was a battle that I won. But there was a next one that I lost. Similar type player. Uh, and my point was, listen, I don't know what other teams do, but we got to stand for something here. And it's again that talent character equation. What is your what is your what is your principle? What do you stand for? Khalil? Is this really what you stand for or what you support? Well, I think that's an interesting way of putting it. <laughs> I mean, those of you who have been around athletics, you know it, it, it takes all types, right? I don't know how much football is different than other sports, but. Uh, you have to mold people from different backgrounds and mold people from different levels of character. You know, I uh, we had some, we did have some criminals with records. I mean, we had a, a you know, a coach used to say, "Well, our criminals are good criminals. <laughs> They're good guys." I'm like, okay. You rationalize, right? Yeah. yeah Alex. Um, so when you were telling that story, um, you know, it kind of made me thinking of like an experience I had <clears throat> this past summer, kind of like marrying the the idea of um, management with agency. So I worked for an agent, um, and this guy that I was working with, not not the agent, not our boss, but another intern. Uh, we found this kid that kind of had. He was a kid, so you know, he was like 18 or 19, um, that had kind of you know like a bad history of essential sexual abuse, drug abuse disorder stuff. But he had a lot of talent that we thought we saw in him. So we kind of went to our agent boss and said, well, what do you think about this guy? And he kind of, that, that interaction was kind of similar to the one you had because, but it's also kind of different because it's from an agency standpoint. Yeah. Like you're going to be representing this guy. Yeah. So like you kind of think differently, like can I help him? Can I steer him on the right path? Or is he kind of a lost cause? And his background or his personality is just not going to lead to an actual professional that is worthwhile representing. Right. So I thought that was just kind of different on, kind of on the agency side of things. Right. And again, I want to be clear, a lot of these guys come from backgrounds where sometimes you wonder how they even uh, did succeed at the levels they did. Uh, and you, you have to reiterate, you have to rejigger your thinking about behavior sometimes. Um, we all have our own personal backgrounds, where we came from, what kind of people we were with, and you do have to adjust. I thought that was very important uh, learning experience I had as an agent, uh, where I'm recruiting people, where I'm stepping over, you know, people on their front stoops. I'm going into homes that I'd never dreamed of being in around. 
uh, with junkies everywhere and things like that, you, you know, you have to rejigger your thinking about what you're looking at. Very, uh, very instructive times. Okay, we mentioned two other incidents going on this exact same time when I keep mentioning the Anheuser-Busch. Uh, here was another one, one of the big stars of the league. Who's talking about Peterson? Your name is? Tori. Tori? Tori, Tori. yeah. And then he was suspended for um, the remaining six. And okay, so Tory talks about the same paradigm we just talked about. On the legal side, what was it? It wasn't even chart for child endangerment. It was for some other uh, some other charge that was sounded like a very mild charge. Okay, so it was a misdemeanor. Um, again, misdemeanor, reckless assault, and that's the court of law. Now we go to the court of Goodell, the court of NFL, and what they decide is uh, year-long suspension, which is, again, dramatic for a running back with limited time in sports, making a lot of money. That's a dramatic impact, a year-long suspension. Back to court we go. The NFL and Peterson appeal. The independent arbitrator at that time was not so independent. It was, guess who? Harold Henderson, who just ruled on Ezekiel Elliott. And not surprisingly, he ruled for the league. The appeal was denied. And just like we continue to talk about, the union went to court. Uh, and the original Okay, we don't have, I don't think we have the final view here. But Peterson on the lower court, Doty is the lower court judge, just like Tom Brady had some success. But it went to the Ninth Circuit, which covered Minnesota, and he lost. Where the Court of Appeals affirmed the power of the commissioner to do this. And once again, we're back to commissioner power, where uh, the NFLPA tries to take this out of the system, just like Elliott's doing. They go to court. They have early success. They go to appeals court, and the appeals court agreed with the commissioner, said the commissioner has the power to do this, upheld commissioner power, and the commissioner power is as strong as ever with this Peterson case. Okay, same pattern that we have been seeing where we have a limited, sometimes we see zero like Elliot, uh, like uh, Rice with the pretrial diversion. Here we have a misdemeanor. The NFL says not so fast. We've got behavior here that we want to discipline. In this case, not with a woman, but with a child. Peterson suspended a year for whatever he did to his son with that switch, a year. Okay, these are dramatic suspensions. Um, upheld. Okay, Peterson's had a long career, still playing. He's missed, he's missed time with injuries a lot, but he missed that entire year, 2014. Uh, because of what he did to his child again. Nothing's in a vacuum. Even though Ray Rice was with a woman, this is the same issue. The NFL is responding to public outrage over the Rice video, and in the same week, pictures of this kid came out. The same week. This is when that firestorm was going on. And if you think back three years ago, it was just an amazing time where the NFL was on the brink. Do you know what, 2014? <laughs> Record ratings. 
record ratings for the NFL with all that going on. Okay? Now, it was a year-long suspension, but when it, the last line there is that they reached an agreement, that was basically a timing thing, because the year-long would have gone into September. Uh, he, was, he wanted to get reinstated for the off-season workout programs and all that, even though he had missed the whole season. The actual suspension was a full year. That was reduced so he could come in in April or whatever uh, and get ready for the next season. So that's why there was an agreement to reduce the suspension calendar-wise, but season-wise, he missed the whole year, 2014. Came back 2015 uh, and, again, had a great season. Last year got hurt. This year he's on the New Orleans Saints. Um, okay, thanks, Tori. What, also the Hardy. Who's talking about Hardy? Another similar situation, the exact same time. Again, picture this firestorm in 2014. Go ahead. Tell me your name. I'm sorry. Joe. Joe? Yeah. Joe, yeah. Uh, so in this situation, And then he appealed. So he appealed. Um, is it Hardy you're talking about? Yeah. Hardy, Hardy appealed. Um, and then it was, it was dismissed. And following the 2014 season, he wasn't re signed with the Panthers. Um, from there, he was signed by the Cowboys for $11.3 million. Um, in 2015, or two months into the season, um, Goodell invoked a 10-game suspension after their investigation wrapped up, which was later reduced to four games after arbitration by, once again, Henderson. Right. Uh, basically, career went down the bottom of that. Right. Okay, good. You see him here with the aforementioned Drew Rosenhaus. Um, he was found uh, guilty. Again, I don't know how this works, but in North Carolina, you have a judge and then a jury trial or something to that effect because the ju judge trial found him guilty of all the things there. He threw his girlfriend against a wall, choked her, threw on a futon covered with rifles. Uh, but then you, you get a, a jury trial. Now, in the jury trial, again, I don't know how this works, but to get a jury trial after being uh, held guilty by a judge, you know, they had to have the complaining witness uh, and the girlfriend. And all of a sudden, days before the jury trial, the witness cannot be found. Um, the DA announces no longer pressing charges because she had disappeared and stopped cooperating. There were rumors out there that she was paid, that there was a civil settlement. No one knows for sure. Um, but all of a sudden, the complaining witness can't be reached and case dismissed. So here we are again. <laughs> the court of law, case dismissed. 
There is nothing going on on the, on the criminal side. There was with the judge, but they need the jury, and the jury doesn't hear from the witness because she's gone, case dismissed. Then we get to the court of Goodell. After the pictures came out, again, visual evidence. Pictures of bruising, pictures of uh, a lot of uh, marks on her body. 10-game suspension. Same drill, appeal through the NFL system. This one did not go to court, but appeal through the NFL system. Uh, 10 games, heard by, again, Harold Henderson. In this case, the 10 games was reduced to four games. But once again, a Pyrrhic victory, because no one has signed Greg Hardy. No one is going to take that chance again with a guy who has the history that he does. He desperately wants to play, as does Ray Rice. It's not happening. Okay. Uh, these are all instances of the commissioner acting above, you could say, the law. Okay, but as Khalil suggested, this is bigger. This is about a business. When we started talking about the commissioner, what do we want the commissioner to stand for? The, the watchwords of competitive balance, that's more on the field or on the diamond or on the court, but the watchword is integrity. You want fans to invest in your product to feel like this is, this is real, this is integrity, this has, this has value. So it's business and law. When you look at this happening on the legal side of things, you as a commissioner, at least what they are saying is, we understand that the authorities have not pressed further. Okay, In Rice's case, pretrial diversion. In Peterson's case, misdemeanor. In Hardy's case, can't find the witness. Case dismissed. In Elliott's case, no charges. We've got a system in, in the most popular sport in the country saying we don't care. We don't care. Imagine that. We have a system that says to the law, we don't care what you found. We've got our own system. Ray Rice, indefinite. Adrian Peterson, a year. Greg Hardy, 10 games. Ezekiel Elliott, six games. So in your own mind, you, you could be thinking, that's not fair. Or you could be thinking, you're right. It doesn't matter what the law does. We've got a product to protect. We'll deal with it. But I want you to have a view on this. Because this is what this class does. Hopefully you dip, think deeper in knowing these kind of things, that sports law has become a bigger, bigger pe uh, part of the discussion every year, ignoring the law. And it's basically what the commissioner is doing. Ignoring is too strong a word. They're not ignoring the law. They're taking note, and they're saying, OK, we're still disciplining. It's what we do. And then you get back to the philosophy. What is going on here? And in my mind, it really comes back to uh, a view of players that should, a view of athletes that should, should be role models. And when they're not role models, they're going to get disciplined. When they behave and behave, when they engage in behavior that is like this, they're going to get disciplined. And it doesn't matter what the DA thought. And my final point is this is not new for Roger Goodell. This is not new. 2010, 
seven years ago in the off season, Ben Roethlisberger in a bar in Georgia did something with a woman in the bathroom. No criminal charges, zero, nothing. And he was suspended six games. So this is not new. So we have this element of moral integrity in sports that has been swirling around for some time here. Players are are held to a higher standard than the law will hold them. And maybe that's the most profound statement out of this. We have sports leagues, management, commissioners, leagues, holding players to a higher standard than the law. And because of the system they created with the collective bargaining agreement, and I think judges will agree as we go forward with Elliot, we'll see next week, that position is endorsed. You can be above the law because it's your game. It's your product. OK, so obviously the Elliott case sort of, because it's happening right now, it kind of swayed this class towards these and all these events that happened in a similar way that brought us to where we are. So we spent the class on that. We'll get back next week to sort of the now between, instead of player and commissioner, we'll look at team and commissioner, and whether commissioners should step in on things like super teams, which I think is really interesting stuff. Okay, see you next week.